In the early 2000s, a controversy erupted over a children's book called King and King. You might remember this story. There's a grumpy queen, and she's really eager for her perpetual bachelor son to finally get married. Very well, he says, mother, with a sigh. I must say, though, I've never cared much for princesses. After a string of failed first dates with lovely ladies from all across the land, our prince finally does fall in love and get married to the brother of one of his potential princess brides. There's no applause. No, what is that? Is it not Ikar? No. So... <laughs> I want to say gay marriage was already legal in Massachusetts when this book came out, but that did not stop parents there from launching what became a national protest against this book. They are trying to indoctrinate our children, they said. They're advancing a homosexual agenda in our public schools. Our kids were little at the time, but we did the only reasonable thing that we could do. We bought 50 copies of the book and we gave them as birthday presents to every kid for the next five years. So I'll tell you why I'm thinking about King and King. Because there's been a dramatic surge in book bans across this country. 1,648 individual titles have been banned in the past year alone. School board meetings have become battlegrounds with seething parents who are amped up on the increasingly violent political rhetoric of our time, accusing teachers and librarians of grooming and pedophilia and distribution of pornography. They're threatening violence and they're filing criminal complaints over books sitting on shelves and in children's hands. Now, I want to say that, that as Jews, we take books very seriously. It was in the Quran that we Jews were first called the people of the book, and we have embraced that designation with love and pride over the centuries. The central image of Yom Kippur this day is Sefer Echaim, the book of life, the book that we're spending the entire day today praying that we'll be written into. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs writes about the astonishing relationship that Jews have with our holiest object, a book. He writes, we stand in its presence as if it were a king. We dance with it as if it were a bride. And God forbid, if it's desecrated or ruined beyond repair, we bury it as if it were a relative who died. When David and I got married, we registered not for kitchen appliances, but for books and the biggest fight that we ever got into is when one of us argued that our books should be arranged by fiction, nonfiction, alphabetical, whereas the other argued by color. <laughs> I won. <laughs> books matter a lot to us. I'm not even sure what I was looking for, but this summer, I began to read as many banned books as I could, and I approached every single one of them with genuine wonder. What could I learn from these texts so menacing, so frightful that they needed to be kept off the shelves? Of course, some of the most important and formative books that I've read in my life are on that list. Toni Morrison's Beloved and the Bluest Eye, Sandra Cisneros' House on Mango Street, the Brilliant Homegoing by Yajiasi, along with unbelievably Anne Frank's diary. Our family prepared for our trip to Poland in June with Art Spiegelman's graphic novel, Mouse, which was banned this past year by a school board in Tennessee that was particularly aggrieved by one image of a dead, partially naked mouse portraying Spiegelman's mother, a Holocaust survivor who died by suicide, and by his use of the word damn. Subsequently, school districts in Florida and Texas removed the book as well. I listened to I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, read by Maya Angelou herself, even though this is considered one of the most important and influential pieces of American literature. School boards across the country are banning this book, decrying its anti-white messaging. This is not the first time that that book has been challenged. For 40 years, Angelou's words have been considered by some to be too vivid, too honest, too dangerous for children to encounter. 
I read Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian, which broke my heart again and again, a story about a boy growing up in the Spokane Indian Reservation, navigating violence and poverty and racism and fighting to survive. It's poignant and it's funny and it's brave. It's been banned for profane language and anti-Christian content. George M. Johnson's book, All Boys Aren't Blue, I found to be beautiful and empathic and pained and joyful all at once. It's a memoir manifesto of a queer black child. It's been banned in more than 12 states. School boards in Florida filed a criminal complaint with the sheriff's department against this book, calling it obscene and pornographic. In Wyoming, library employees were threatened with criminal charges for stocking any book with LGBTQ characters. And a mayor in Mississippi refused to release any money for the entire county library system until all books with LGBTQ characters were removed from the library. Heather McGee writes about how racism drained the pools. When after those desegregation mandates came down, many towns chose to shutter their public pools so that their white children would not have to share with black children even though that meant denying their own children a place to swim. This brand of self-injury is not new in America. Now, the stated rationale for these book bans is the need to protect our children's innocence, lest they encounter vulgar language, portrayals of violence, sex, and sexuality. Of course, it occurs to me that if you're worried about sex, there's another book that really needs to be on your radar. It's a classic. It has loads of explicit sexual content, more than any of the banned books that I read this summer. It starts off with a guy named Adam and a woman named Eve frolicking naked in public and not even being ashamed. Then Avram pretends that his hot wife is his sister, twice, lending her to Pharaoh and Avimelech in order to save his own life. Sarah encourages her husband to sleep with their nanny. Lot offers his virgin daughters to an angry mob of sex offenders. Leah and Rachel, who are sisters, marry the same guy. And then they fight for the next several years over who's going to sleep with him each night. Jacob impregnates both of them and then has sex with their handmaids as well. Tamar dresses up as a prostitute and has sex with her father-in-law. And Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph and then accuses him of attempted rape. And that's just in the book of Genesis. Wait until you see what happens with King David. This Maybe they're worried about violence. How about a book in which Abel is murdered by his own brother, in which humanity is so violent and corrupt that God decides to drown every one of them with the exception of Noah and his family and start all over again. Dina's brothers coerce an entire town of men into circumcising themselves, and then they attack and murder them all in their weakened state, and the brothers sell Joseph into slavery, and then they lie about it to their bereaved father. Again, that's just in the book of Genesis. So if what you're worried about is sex and violence, vulgarities and profanities, then really the Bible is the book that you need to ban. But of course, it never was about the naked mouse, was it? It never was about protecting the innocence of our children. And I'll tell you how I know this, because the very same political leaders who will fly into a fit of rage over dangerous books will fight equally vigorously to defeat efforts that would actually protect our children, whether from guns in our schools, from poverty or hunger, from, from police violence, from sexual violence, from the stigmatization of mental illness. Instead of protecting our children from real threats, they will expend limitless energy trying to protect our children from reading narrative fiction about those threats. I talked to Julie Gohler about this. Where are you? Where are you, Julie? Julie, hi. Julie's a beloved literature teacher and a dear ECAR member, and she pointed out that if what we really want is to protect our children, then shielding them from ideas is precisely the wrong thing to do. 
Great literature teaches kids difficult things, she said. Things we'd rather not have our children experience on their own, but we want them to recognize as they struggle in the world writ large. Julie argues that when we encounter stories about racism and homophobia, about disability and about poverty and other struggles in books, we grow in sensitivity and in resiliency. So I want to ask, what's really driving this fervid effort to purge our shelves of the kind of smut that you might find in Pulitzer Prize winning novels, memoirs, and the Bible? To get to the heart of this, I think we have to ask a more foundational question. What really is the point of great literature? Now, years ago, I heard Angie Thomas speak in a breakout session at the Obama summit. Thomas is the author of a book called The Hate You Give. It's the story of Star Carter, who's a 16-year-old black girl who is the witness to, as a white officer, shoots and kills her unarmed best friend, another black high school student. Thomas shared that she learned from one of her teachers that books are either mirrors, windows, or sliding glass doors. I want mine, she said, to be all three. This formulation really helped me, and it helps us understand exactly what we and what our children lost when those 1,648 books were banned in this past year. They lost a mirror an opportunity for self-understanding. Larry Weber, another brilliant teacher of literature and writing, who's also my brother-in-law and also here in this room somewhere, says that books are our clearest means of imagining ourselves. When we recognize our own struggles, I believe, in the pages of a book, we become a little bit less lonely. I know that that's happened to me and I'm sure it has to you too. And that visibility, that connectivity can actually be a lifeline. This may not surprise you, but of the books that were banned in the past year, nearly all of them featured LGBTQ plus characters, protagonists who are BIPOC, black, indigenous, and people of color, or both. I'm just going to say that again. Nearly every one of the 1,648 books banned in the last year featured queer people or people of color or both. When characters come, coming from underrepresented identities appear in literature, readers who share those identities are given a chance to see themselves, ourselves, in all of their beauty and vulnerability. Listen to what James Baldwin says about this. You think that your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world. But then you read. It was books that taught me, he said, that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all of the people who were alive and who had ever been alive. Book bans deny us this mirror. They also take away a window. I love Barbara Kingsolver's explanation of how fiction works. She says, it lifts you away from your chair and stuffs you gently down inside someone else's point of view. A newspaper could tell you, for example, that 100 people died today, and you could think to yourself, oh, how very sad, and then turn the page. But a novel can take just one of those 100 lives and show you exactly how it felt to be that person rising from bed that morning, watching the desert light on the tile of her doorway, and on the curve of her daughter's cheek, you could taste that person's breakfast and love her family and sort through her worries as your own and know that a death in that household will be the end of the only life that someone will ever have. As important as yours, as important as mine. So literature compels us to imagine not only ourselves, but each other. It opens our hearts to ache for and to empathize with each other, to identify with each other's struggle. That's the window. And perhaps the greatest loss when a book is banned is the sliding door. This is when a story somehow changes us. It compels us to exit the closed ecosystem that we've been inhabiting and to walk differently through the world. In 1862, 
There was a short story that was published in Britain about a small boy who dies while working as a chimney sweep. And that story so deeply touched people's hearts that it fueled a national movement to end child labor. That's sliding door literature. What happens to your view of health care or income inequality when you fall in love with a boy growing up on the reservation without access to proper dental care? Or when you read about Star Carter's experience with police violence, or a young Maya Angelou witnessing the humiliation of her proud and proper mama by racist white children. These stories don't just hurt our hearts, they challenge us to work to eradicate the unjust conditions that fuel the human suffering all around us. That's because stories cultivate empathy. They help us see ourselves, they help us see each other, and they change the way that we live. As, as King Salva writes, art is the antidote that can call us back from the edge of numbness, restoring the ability to feel for one another. So if literature is fundamentally a conduit for empathy, then it stands to reason that book bans are an active attempt to block empathy. And then we must ask, who benefits in a society in which people cannot feel for one another? On our Ikar Europe trip this summer, we visited the Bebelplatz. It's a large piazza in the heart of Berlin. This is a plaza that's surrounded by magnificent buildings, the Opera House, a cathedral, the university, all symbols of German culture and sophistication. It was on that site in May of 1933 that tens of thousands of people gathered as the Nazi German Student Association burned 20,000 books in a bonfire. And there were simultaneous book burnings that took place across dozens of German cities. 100,000 books were burned that day. The targeted books were written by some of the great thinkers of Europe, many of them Jews, Karl Marx and Rosa Luxemburg, Sigmund Freud and Bertolt Brecht, their work was seen as evidence of an un-German spirit, symbols of decadence and moral decay. This was eight years before the final solution. This was nine years before the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto. But it was a harbinger of what was to come. And the memorial that stands on that site today is haunting. It's a subterranean, empty library. And it's engraved with a warning from Heinrich Hein which was written a century before the Nazis rose to power. He writes, where they burn books, they will also burn people. It may have seemed over this past year that the fevered pitch around books is some kind of grassroots organic movement of parent activists who are spontaneously and coincidentally waking up to the dangers lurking in their children's syllabi. But it is important that we know that this is no grassroots movement. Book bans rarely are. This is a coordinated effort to suppress the cultivation of empathy, and it is led by a small and well-funded group of far-right organizations in our country. These groups are animated by the ascendant white supremacist conspiracy theory known as the Great Replacement. The night that the white nationalists marched in Charlottesville in 2017, remember? Chanting, Jews will not replace us. I remember watching in astonishment while the news anchors reported that they were saying, you will not replace us, even though I knew that I heard what I heard, and so did you. And like many of you, I wondered that night, what did the Jews have to do with this? I don't want to replace you. Well, we spent the next several years learning precisely what the Jews have to do with this. And thanks to the groundbreaking work of my friend Eric Ward and others, we have learned the centrality of anti-Semitism in white nationalist ideology. Now, it's possible that that Jewish question was so perplexing and was so personal that it overshadowed the bigger question, which is, why are you so afraid of being replaced. The Great Replacement posits that white people are being replaced by immigrants, by black people, by Muslims and other people of color, 
And of course, Jews are the puppet masters who are responsible for orchestrating it all. This idea lived on the fringes for years. Today, it's increasingly mainstream and it is increasingly violent, stoking terrorist attacks in America and abroad over the course of the last several years. Those who submit to this thinking see their world order, white, Christian, heterosexual, cisgendered, patriarchal, as fragile and endangered. They don't simply fear that they're gonna be replaced by a new workforce. Their jobs will go to migrants, for example. They worry that their identity will be replaced. Their dominance, their hegemony. There's a war on Christianity, they say. There's a war on the nuclear family, a war on free speech, a war on the police, a war on masculinity. They say there's a war on red meat. They lean on the rhetoric of war because they believe that their way of life is under attack. And it seems that they believe that in war, victory goes to those who coarsen their hearts to the enemy. Remember, the very essence of good literature is that it renders another's heart visible to us. Art humanizes the other. This is an incredible threat to the simplicity of a worldview that relies on the dehumanization of the other. Expansive, empathic thinking poses a mortal threat to the supremacist's dark ambition for this country. And so on this Yom Kippur, I must bring before the committee that banned mouse and gender queer and the kite runner my proposal for the Bible to be banned once and for all. Not this time for its sexual and violent content because I don't really believe that you care very much about that. Clearly, not because I'm averse to religion because look, <laughs> some Bible banners before me have been. But because I am certain that if what you really want is to protect your children from cultivating empathy toward those on the margins, those who struggle and suffer under the weight of oppression, this text, this text is not only unsavory, it's downright dangerous. The very premise of this book is that all human beings, every single one of us is created in God's own image and every single person therefore deserves to be treated with dignity and love. That the, our diversity, not our uniformity, is a testament to the greatness of God. That God hears the cries of the oppressed and acts to overturn empires until liberation is achieved. That the work of redemption is not yet done and will not be done until all are able to enter the promised land. What book could be more dangerous than this book. This book is a mirror. Look at the prophet Yonah, who we're going to read this afternoon, this reluctant prophet, desperately trying to flee the call to become himself. This guy is petty and he's small, even when the world is clearly demanding of him big things. Malbim, a 19th century Ukrainian rabbi, essentially suggests that Yonah is suffering from preacher's kid syndrome. He just wants to be left alone so he can forge his own path. Who cannot relate to that? This book is a window. I want to remind you of why we blow shofar on these holy days. In the Song of Deborah, which is considered one of the oldest biblical texts, we read the story of Sisera. He was a, a Canaanite commander, and he ruthlessly oppressed the, Israel, the, the Israelite people for 20 years. And then through courage and ingenuity, the Jews are finally able to defeat Sisera. And we expect to read a story of great celebration. They are free at last. But instead, the point of view in this book shifts to our enemy's mother. She's gazing out the window, awaiting her son's return from war with a dread in her heart that every parent can relate to. Why is his chariot so long in coming, she asks. In desperation. Our tradition teaches that Sisera's mother's cries when she realizes that she will never again see her son are simulated in the blasts of the shofar that we sound on these holy days. Yes, this is what I'm saying to you. The most iconic Jewish sound is an echo of our enemy's mother wailing after we defeat him. It kind of makes you think, right? 
Of course, this book is also a sliding door, doggedly demanding that our own experiences of heartache and oppression and humiliation leave us with a mandate to grow in empathy toward those who are most vulnerable. You shall not oppress the stranger. You, you know the soul of the stranger. This is the dominant thread throughout the Torah, and it reconnects us repeatedly to our people's most foundational moment, not of power, but of powerlessness when we were enslaved in Egypt so that we feel a kinship, a solidarity with those who continue to suffer with powerlessness today. But then look at Isaiah, who we read just a few moments ago. Sorry, folks, he says, but your sacred kinship is simply not enough. What I need is for you to build a just society. I need you to care for the poor and the widow and the orphan. I need you to feed the hungry and protect the vulnerable. Your gestures of religiosity and your expressions of solidarity and sympathy mean absolutely nothing to you if your heartache does not translate into moral action. I don't just want empathy, he says. I want transformational empathy. Walk through that door. If you're going to ban beloved, then surely you must ban the Bible, for this may be the most dangerous book of all. And by the way, these culture warriors, these protectors of empire, they know exactly how dangerous this book is. Generations ago, they did ban portions of the Bible, but only from the hands of the oppressed. They excised the most dangerous parts of our story from what was called the slave Bible. They were fearful that enslaved people would find fuel for their righteous struggle for liberation in the Israelites' journey for freedom. And when Nat Turner was captured after inspiring a rebellion of enslaved people in 1831, in his hands was his dog-eared Bible, a constant companion and source of spiritual strength. Well, from that point on, enslaved people were forbidden from even reading the Bible without a white censor in the room with them. The ruling class has always understood the power and the danger of this book. This is not to pretend that the Bible is some kind of benign, saccharine, feel-good text. I know what it means to be in relationship with a book that breaks your heart. And sometimes Torah breaks mine. And even still, even when this text evidences a painful lack of sensitivity to the nature of power and violence and the human heart, our response is not to ban the text, not to erase it, but instead to wrestle with it, to talk about it, to struggle with it, to translate it, to interpret it, and to find meaning in it even still. In 1995, Toni Morrison gave an address at Howard University called Racism and Fascism. And she said the following, let us be reminded that before there is a final solution, there must be a first solution, and then a second one, and even a third one. The move toward a final solution is not a jump. It takes one step, and then another, and then another. Maybe you're a little bit surprised that I'm using this platform on this day to talk about book bannings. I hope you understand why I see this as so essential and urgent for us. I am not a Holocaust alarmist, as you know well. But willful negligence is the only way that we can ignore the echoes of our past in our present. In the spring, a legislator in the Tennessee State House offered and ultimately passed a bill that would require public school librarians to submit all book titles for approval. That lawmaker was asked, what will we do with the books that have to be removed from the shelves? I would burn them, he said. This is America 2022. This book banning craze is not a phase, it's not a political ploy before the midterm elections, it's a hint of where we are headed. It is an admonition. There is a dangerous movement that is gripping our nation 
and Gripping the World, a movement that has the strong force of precedent behind it. But this movement can succeed only if we go numb. So aside from doing everything we possibly can to keep those who hold this dangerous ideology out of positions of power, it is obvious what we must do in the days ahead. The greatest response to a movement that depends on calloused hearts is to make our hearts even more tender toward one another. If art is the antidote to numbness, then we must read and we must write, we must wonder, we must learn, we must create art. And when we do, we will find not only access to one another's world, but a greater understanding of our own as well. I learned that from a book I love, the most dangerous and the most wonderful book of all. Vahavtem et ager, ki gerim ha'item be'eretz Mitzrayim. Open your heart with love, even to the other. For once, long ago, in Egypt, you too were a stranger. Shana tova. I pray that we're all written into the book of life.